We've been speaking about this series, Joy in the Shadows. As I often say after baptisms, we could just finish the service right there and you're going to have something to take home, amen? You're going to have something to take home that inspires and gets you to think and reflect about your own life. But we've just been having a fabulous time looking through the book of Philippians. Paul wrote it while he was in prison, while he had people that were close to him, that were backstabbing him, while he had his freedoms and his liberties taken away. But he writes this letter with more freedom than what a lot of us experience when we have the freedom to do whatever we want. And he writes with a freedom and he writes with a joy. And as we've been discovering this series, it's about the joy that is ours. It's our birthright as Christians. And it should be like the worst crime that you can commit as a Christian is not to make, is, is not to sin every now and again because people understand that Christians sin or make mistakes or hurt people or, you know, like we, we're broken people. We're not perfect. You show me a perfect Christian and, well, that person that says that they're perfect is probably a hypocrite because they're not perfect. The world doesn't need us to all be perfect, but I tell you, because Jesus was perfect, but and we're called to be holy, even though we still make mistakes. I think the biggest crime of Christianity is when we make Christianity seem boring and irrelevant. Because it presents this picture that the gospel makes no difference to the way we live. And I would say to you this morning, may it not be so of us. Not because we're any better than other people, just because we're grateful for what we have in Jesus. We're like the parable, you know, there's there's, there's a story, um, it's not a parable, there's a story in the Gospels of these people that come to Jesus for healing and all of them are healed, but only one comes back to say thank you. And you see, true spiritual life is about living life as a thank you to what God has already done in Christ. Not because we want God's favour, but because we have God's favour, because we have God's blessing, because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, it transforms the way we see today and tomorrow. And we say, God, because you have saved me, because you love me before I love you, I'm going to spend the rest of my life spending time with you and getting to know you. And as you spend time getting to know God, you become more like Him and you love Him more and more and you want more and more because you realize that God is good, God is love, and God is the giver of every good gift. I started the series by drinking coffee on stage. I felt like Pastor Bill was getting a bit nervous. Um, Just this week, people have been sending me their photos of drinking coffee with the lid off. Can you put the photo up, will you? So like, just people... (laughs) Like Dan Pizalak, Chris Kipitoglu, Sam Chester. That was a particularly unflattering photo of Sam, so I thought I'd got to put that up. Ryan took that one. And, um, and it's just funny. Like I just said, Nikki, people are sending me photos of them drinking coffee with the lid off. And I'm like, am I going to become that guy that just gets random selfies of people drinking coffee? Um, and maybe I'll get even more from now on. Good thinking, Tim. Um, But, you know, because I started by saying it's like coffee. You can drink life in the fast lane, drinking coffee through a takeaway coffee through a plastic lid and and just getting on with your life on autopilot and just trying to get the caffeine out of that coffee and not experiencing it. Or you can sit down like a civilized person and you can actually drink that coffee and you can take the lid off and you can smell it and you can just enjoy all of the glory of coffee. And, 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 you know, coffee is a wonderful thing, but the joy of the Lord is yours. You have it. You are a Christian. It's your birthright. And the fruit of the Spirit is joy. And the Holy Spirit within you has said joy can be found in the Holy Spirit. He lives in you, and He wants to give you more and more joy. Joy is your birthright. You don't have to ask for it. But there's things that we can do that diminish joy, put the lid on that joy so we don't enjoy the fullness of what it means to be a Christian. And so we have the Apostle Paul writing from prison and he says over and over again, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Just this week in our Life Journal readings, I was reading through the book of 1 Thessalonians. 
And um, if, if you don't read the Bible regularly, this is not to make you feel ashamed. This is just an encouragement. You need to read the Bible regularly. If it's not daily, regularly throughout the week, because God can speak to you. Even this week, I've had the opportunity to share this scripture with a number of people because God spoke to me just through a very simple passage. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 to 22, Paul is getting so excited that he just starts spitting out a whole pile of thoughts all at once because that's sometimes how I feel I'm like God I don't want to speak in paragraphs I want to speak in short statements because it's all in there it needs to come out and that's what Paul does this is what he says rejoice always it's like he's finished his letter and he just wants to get this out rejoice always pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances isn't that good rejoice always pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances. And and I think, and then he goes on to say, for that is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And so, so many of us, we spend our lives, even as Christians, saying, God, I want to know your will for my relationships. I want to know your will for my business. I want to know your will for my future. I want to know your will for this or that. And, And we say, God, I want to know your will. And what we're really saying is, God, I want you to give me a better life. And God is saying, and and it says, well, okay, here's the answer. God's will for you is that you rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. And if you are a person that gives thanks in all circumstances, if you're a person that prays continually, if you're a person that rejoices always, that is evidence of a person that is full, that is whole that is lacking nothing. And you can actually build not just a resilience, but a thriving and a flourishing and a joyfulness. And, and, and I don't know about you, but I see the people in my life that are thankful, that are full, that are whole. And these are not people that have the absence of suffering and difficulty in their lives. These are not the people that have everything given to them. In fact, some of the worst thing that you can give to a young person, we've had some young people get baptized tonight, uh, this morning. And some of the worst things that you can see with young people are young people that's parents give them everything that they want. And you see what it does to their soul. And they don't become bigger people. Just giving us what we want doesn't actually make us more like Jesus. I don't know about you, but... Some of my moments where I felt closer to God are when I'm on my knees thinking, I need help. There's a purity, there's a simplicity that doesn't come when I'm doing life in my own strength. Let's have a look at Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I could sing, but I'm not going to because we've got visitors here. (laughs) Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I'll say it again, rejoice. And it's like there's an authority that you have when you're in prison telling people to be joyful out loud that I don't have standing on stage with a microphone. But I tell you, if I was in prison and you'd be like, well, we better rejoice because he told us to. Let your gentleness be evident for all. The Lord is near. Everyone say the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Oh, But in every situation, by prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will. Everyone say, will. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Can everyone say content? I know what it is to be in need. Can I hear an amen if anyone knows what it is to be in need? And I know what it is to have plenty Some of us know that. I've learned the secret of being content in every and any situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. There's a new life available for the Christian, but I think many of us, we need a new, new life. Some of us, if if you're going through a crisis in your life and you're saying, Tim, I want peace in my life. Or some of you, you're saying, I need just some emotional freedom in my life. I feel bound up emotionally. 
And for some of you, you're just sad and you need happiness in your life. Peace, emotional freedom, happiness. If you were to come to someone like myself and say, Tim, help us. I need peace. I need guidance. I need emotional happy. I need happiness. I need emotional freedom in this situation or that situation. If I told you that the answer is read the Bible and pray, I think your eyes would glaze over and you'd say, oh, don't give me the pastor's answer. Give me something that really works, Tim. Give me a key. Give me a, a revelation, a bomb that falls from heaven. It's a revelation. It opens up my life. And like everything was, I was blind. And now I see because the prophet of God has spoken into my life. Don't just tell me to pray, Lockins. Don't just tell me that the answer is Jesus. Give me something more. And I think sometimes what we can do is we can have a spiritual malaise in our lives where we actually don't believe that God has good answers for our problems anymore. In fact, we start believing that the only answers to our problems are that Jesus is going to return one day. And the Bible makes it clear that there's a, a, a real lived experience of the fullness of the kingdom of God today. In fact, so many aspects of the kingdom of God, God's reign of rule and love are available today, but there are some things that we will not fully realize until Jesus returns and we see him face to face and we know him as he knows us. But I really believe this morning that God is going to give you such an encouragement in your inner person by the Holy Spirit that things can change and it's not hypothetical. There's some actions that you can take. There's some steps that you can take to take hold of what is already yours a life of joy that actually makes a difference, that you can live a new life, that you can live in such a way in all circumstances that people say there's something different about her, there's something different about him. Because I believe that's God's will. And I believe this passage shares it very specifically. I find it interesting in verse 5, it says that the Lord is near. You know, we ask for peace and we ask for emotional freedom and we ask for happiness because aren't they the great quests of life the quest to be at peace the quest to be free the quest to be happy the only reason why we can ask for these things it's because the lord is near we're not trying to get into heaven we're, we're believing that god of heaven has come to earth and he is near and by his spirit he is in us and so we ask from a position of confidence not pleading So the first quest is the quest for peace. I want you to say this. I used to be anxious, but now I pray. Do you know how many times I've caught myself being anxious and prayer is not only a last resort, but sometimes it's an afterthought. Is that true of you? I wonder how many of us are being anxious about things in our life and the extent of our prayer life is this, oh God, I'm feeling really bad about this, take it away. And then we go back to being anxious again. And we invest 99% of our attention on the thing that we're anxious about, the relationship or the financial situation or the work situation or just something going on in our life that's out of our control. And we invest 99% on being anxious and we spend 1% on prayer. And don't tell me that prayer, see, we believe that prayer is a passive thing, but I believe prayer is a weapon that God gives us as followers of Jesus. You see, in the Bible, in, I think it's 1 Corinthians, it says, don't fight with the weapons of this world. And so we fight with, um, if you're struggling with anxiety, I'm not talking about uh, anxiety as a mental illness, a condition that some people in this room um, are going through, have gone through. And I would always encourage you, if you're struggling with anxiety or depression, go and see a counsellor, go and see a, a clinical psychologist and get help for that because it's, um, it's something that... I know people in this room that have been struggling with anxiety that have become free just through seeing a counsellor, seeing, seeing a psychologist, cognitive behavioural therapy or medication, and it's been brilliant, okay? But I'm not talking about that kind of anxiety. I'm talking about the anxiety that you and I all go through. Unease, uncertainty, agitation, dread, fear, just that feeling inside of you that just is driving you crazy. Obsession, worry. Prayer is not passive. 
Prayer is saying from this point on, I am choosing to not give power to my anxiety over this thing. And I'm choosing to not be independent, to try to make it, solve it in my own strength. I'm choosing to be dependent upon God. And I'm falling to my knees and I'm saying, God, I am struggling with this anxiety, but I am going to throw myself at your mercy and I need you to help me. You see, in this passage in Philippians 4 verses 6 and 7, it says, don't be anxious about anything. It doesn't say, try not to be anxious. It says, do not be anxious. But instead of that, by prayer, petition, present your request to God. The Greek uses three different words. It talks about presenting your request to the Lord. It talks about prayer and it talks about petitioning the Lord. It's like Paul is saying, whatever way you can, persistently go to the Lord. So whenever anxiety comes into your head, whenever you start stressing or worrying or obsessing, start praying by petition, start praying by presenting your requests or start praying by just praying however you want. And so be creative, be persistent and be bold in your prayer life. Do not be passive Prayer is a spiritual action that empowers and shifts anxiety because we are connecting with the source of our life. I also think that it's fascinating that prayer, petition, and presenting your request to the Lord is in the context of thanksgiving. It's not saying, hey, God, I just thank you in advance that Martin's going to give me 50 bucks after the service. Thank you, Jesus. I just believe by faith. I name it and claim it in Jesus' name. And if he doesn't, he's going to be disobeying the Lord. Because I've said it in front of all these people. No, no, no. It's like, God, I need 50 bucks. I don't know how I'm going to get it, but I thank you that you are so good. And the posture of my life is no matter what, I'm for you because you have given everything for me. You see, Thanksgiving is not a tool to manipulate God. Thanksgiving is a posture to say, God, everything that I have, even my ability to speak to you comes from a position of intimacy and favor. And I thank you in advance, no matter what. That's what it means to pray with thanksgiving. And, and it means, you know, like when I pray with my daughter of a night, I'll, I'll put my three fingers up and I say, before we ask God for what we want, we have to think about three things to be thankful for. And she's pretty good at it. I think sometimes as adults, we would not be so good at thinking about three things to be thankful for before we get to our shopping list. Joy and, and peace as well is a fruit of the Spirit. We should expect it, we should name it, and we should claim it. And we should say, God, I claim the peace that is mine by the Holy Spirit. And I want to walk in that. And where I do not feel like I'm walking in that peace, I'm going to pray and I'm going to believe for a breakthrough in that area of anxiety. I love it in um, Proverbs 4 verse 23, it says to guard our hearts because our hearts are the wellspring of life. You know, sometimes anxiety, it's not just about our thought life, it's almost about our, there's something about our whole being that is affected. It's our thoughts and it's our heart. It says here that the peace of God will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Mark Twain said this, I've had a lot of worries in my life, most of which never happened. Think about the great worries in your life as a teenager. I could, I, I could be very vulnerable and tell you what my greatest fears and worries were. And you would be like, and, and, and if I actually wrote down how many hours I spent worrying about that and the things that those anxieties and those fears and those worries stopped me from doing, like if I could go back to high school now, I wouldn't have those fears and anxieties because I know that God's got it. I know that, that they're not grounded in fact. Man, imagine if we could actually take hold of this freedom we have in Christ. So the quest for peace. The next quest is the quest for emotional freedom. You know, um, I think there's times in your life where you need to fill yourself with different kinds of influences. For instance, when I was a newlywed, and actually for most of my adult life, I've been the guy that loves watching SBS News or ABC News 24, I always have the news on. And there are times when if you start read the newspapers and you're really involved in the political process, it can actually get really depressing. You know what I mean? Because you're just focusing, sometimes just reading the newspaper or just reading about what's happening in the world, it can be overwhelming and debilitating in how much it need the, in need the world is. Does everyone know what I mean by that? So, so when I had kids, the great thing is you, you, don't, you don't actually have freedom about what you watch on television anymore. You just have to watch ABC Kids. 
And, and in the early days, and you get to watch cartoons, and it's great. You get to rediscover, and it's a great way to escape. And I think particularly, I think all people need to escape. I think particularly men love to escape. And um, it's, great to, um, it's great to watch ABC Kids, actually, because you can just tune off. And you just laugh and, you know, it's great. But there also becomes a point where you can completely disengage from what's happening in the world. And you can live in your own little compartmental, nice little mushy middle class existence and not think about the big questions of life. There's also a time for, I know some people here watch trashy TV, like reality TV. Why do we do that? Just to escape and have a laugh at other people that are hysterical and weird and controversial. And some of you might have been watching The Bachelor this week. And it's entertaining and disturbing all at once. I love crime dramas. I love, like, British crime dramas. Does anyone... Can I hear an amen? But, but there's times when it's just a great story and you get into it. And, and then there's times when you start... Okay, when you start dreaming about murders. It's like... Okay, it's probably time to stop watching these crime dramas. It's getting a bit morbid. I believe that so much of our emotional freedom is shaped, that the Holy Spirit wants to give us emotional freedom. And I'm not talking about spiritual freedom, I'm talking about our emotions here. And I believe that some of us have a tendency towards catastrophizing, seeing everything is worse than what it is. And some of us have a tendency towards compartmentalizing and keeping everything in nice, neat little boxes and not taking responsibility. And I believe that God wants us not to catastrophize or compartmentalize, but to visualize the world as he sees it. Let's have a look at um, Philippians 4, 8 to 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think about such things. What, that, what does that mean? It means to ponder these things. These are the things that you give weight to. These are the things that you think about as you're falling asleep at night, not breakfast. These are the things that you think about and you give attention to. What I love is, you know what Paul doesn't say? He doesn't say, don't look at any secular art. He doesn't say, don't, you know, listen to any of this music. He doesn't say, just read the Torah, read the Bible and go to and, and meet with other believers. He doesn't say to become, to live your life in a ghetto and cut off from any negative influences. He says, whatever is good, whatever is lovely, whatever is beautiful, whatever is noble, whatever is excellent or worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Um, the context makes it clear that he's actually talking about the broader culture. The Greco-Roman culture, and even um, and, and it's a traditional way of relating to the way that the Stoics used to list virtues. He's actually saying wherever you see something that's good and praiseworthy, that brings attention to the, the grace of God, think about those things. Whether it's in a beautiful sunset, whether it's out in creation, whether it's um, watching a movie um, that's just an amazing story and makes you think about whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, think about these things. We need to be better at meditating on things that enlarge our lives rather than diminishing our lives. Amen? And so it doesn't mean we have to live in a ghetto. But by the same token, what it's saying is, um, Paul goes on to say, um, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, put it into practice. So he's not saying just adopt and take in all of the art, all of the culture of the world around you. He's saying find that that's good and inspires and focus on that. Whatever is true. And for some of you, it's just... Renewing your mind by focusing on things that are true, focusing on things that are pure in a world that is just filled with images that are impure. Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, think about such things. So some of us live life in compartments. We think that what we watch or what we surround ourselves with does not affect us spiritually. I can watch whatever I want. That's just how I escape. It doesn't affect me spiritually. Rhubarb is what I'd say to that. But we need to, make, we need to realize that we are not human beings of compartments. We are human beings made in the image of God. And we actually have to embrace and we have to renew our minds and we have to dwell on things that enlarge in our lives and make us more like Jesus. 
and, and give us a, a vision of the gospel, whether it's within the church, within the word of God, or within the general creation. Some of us also live with an emotional filter which is overly negative, fearful, or disillusioned. We must always fight the impulse for fear and a pessimistic vision of the future. Always. If you are watching the news or you're watching the political process and you are just fearful and pessimistic about the future, you actually need to stop watching the news for a week and you need to start just reading the scriptures and get a sense of where the world is going. And then get a vision for the future and how you can be part of it. And rather than thinking about all the things that you can't do to change the world, start being filled with the Holy Spirit vision of what you can do to change the world. Because God cares about people and you are on this planet to bless people and show them the love of God. As we finish, we're going to pray for you. If you're struggling with your thought life, that you will have the ability to think about what is good, what is pure, what is beautiful, what is excellent, what is praiseworthy, so that you can start having the Holy Spirit change your vision for the future so that it's joyful and hope-filled, not pessimistic or not escapist. And the third quest is the quest for happiness. I think a lot of us search for happiness by pursuing success. I believe Paul is saying, I used to seek success and now I embrace less. He says that in verse 11, I'm not saying this because I have, sorry, he says in verse 11, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in every and any situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether to live in plenty or in want. You see, I've seen this in my life that my happiness is not contingent upon how much stuff I have. True happiness comes from actually dependence. I see a lot of people thinking I'll be happy if I'm independent of responsibility. If I was just on my own, yeah, I'll be, I'll be completely happy if I just cut off from any, depend, any dependence to other people. But true happiness, unlike the Stoics of the day, is independence. The philosophers of that day believed that that there was humiliation in humility. To actually be someone that bowed your knee and said, I have nothing to offer. I am in need. I have nothing to contribute. I need your help, God. That posture of humility was seen as humiliation. The Christian church and the Christian gospel completely revolutionized not just the Christian church, but the Western world to the point where today, humility is not a vice, it's considered a virtue. Christian, the Christian gospel changed the way Western civilization thinks about humility from being a negative to being a positive thing. For Paul to admit that he, need, that he was in need and that whether he had a lot or whether he had little, it did not affect his flourishing in life. Paul is careful not to revel in the times of prosperity. His relationship with Christ and in Christ made both the plenty and the want irrelevant. And it's in that context that he says, therefore, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Don't you love that passage? Uh, You you might have someone in your life and they're like, I I just, I believe I can be a nuclear physicist when I grow up. And then you realize that they can't actually do science and they can't do maths. And that's when you say, well, you can believe that, but it's probably not going to happen. Or if a kid comes up to you and says, I believe I can fly. And you're like, because I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Good luck. Maybe he might do it, but eh, probably not. Or like um, Steph Curry, the greatest basketballer arguably in the world at the moment, on his boots, he's got this little scripture that says, I can do all things through Christ. Praise the Lord. But you know what? He didn't win the NBA final this year. Cleveland won. And um, I saw this funny satirical website with Steph Curry with his hands in his head and, and it said, Steph Curry just realizes the context to the, to the scripture, I can do all things through Christ. Because the context is that the all things that you can do in Christ is you can flourish and be joyful whether you have a lot or whether you have nothing. Whether you have that ring or you have nothing, whether you have that badge, whether you have that medal or nothing. And so Steph Curry is now enjoying the fullness of Jesus by not being the NBA champion. But he can still, but, but 
You can't tell me that that's not, as a human being, a real joy, a real flourishing. And, and, and you can't tell me that one of those Cleveland Cavaliers guys that actually won the championship, that right now their life is not in turmoil. And then that championship, if their life is falling apart, if they don't have the joy of the Lord, that win means very little. You see, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Do you know what that is? It's a statement of faith saying, no matter what comes my way, I will not be moved or shaped by the circumstances around me. It says that my position as a child of God, as a favoured person in the kingdom of God, someone that is fearfully and wonderfully made, someone that has a purposefulness built into my DNA and that God has good plans for my future, nothing can take that away. My position in Jesus will not change. And as a result, my perspective and my posture is always going to be for Him, no matter what storm comes my way. So I want to pray as we finish this service. Can we?